morning. Uh, so yesterday we thought about how we would do double integrals, so integrals with respect to two variables, over domains that were very straightforward, so nice rectangular domains, and domains that were a little more awkward in shape, so they might be bounded by functions. And we thought about how in some examples it was better to integrate with respect to x first and then y, and in others it's better to do it the other way around. So what we're going to do today is think about more complex domains that we want to integrate over, but this time think about whether we can think about changing the coordinate system so that we make our lives easier. So for example, if you're integrating functions over a circular domain, then it would make sense to go to plain polar coordinates. And we'll see examples of that today and also uh, in the lecture on Monday when we think about volume integrals over more complicated uh, coordinates. So I want to just start with an example where we're going to think about integrating the area of a disk. So we want to ask the question, calculate the area of the disk given by, so in Cartesian coordinates, x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to a squared. Now obviously this is something that we don't really need to do a complicated calculation. We all know what the area of this is going to be, but this is really just to illustrate different ways that we can use to get to the answer. So we know the answer, let's hope that we get the answer is pi a squared, or we've done something wrong. Okay, so let's just draw ourselves a picture. So x, y, and here's my disk. Okay, so a nice circular disk of radius a. So we can proceed by doing it in Cartesian coordinates. It's perfectly fine to do it. So let's suppose, for the sake of argument, we integrate first with respect to y. So with respect to y, and then with respect to x. OK, so we know that the boundary of this domain, the boundary of our unit's uh, circle of radius a, is given by x squared plus y squared equals a squared. And so if I want to write, if I'm going to integrate first with respect to y and then with respect to x, I need to write down how this boundary, how, well, how, the, how the boundary shape the, uh, varies if I write y as a function of x. And so I can rearrange this and I just get y equals plus or minus the square root of a squared minus x squared. Okay, so what I'm doing in this particular example is thinking about dividing this into vertical slithers, where the bottom is minus the square root of a squared minus x squared, and the top is plus a squared minus x squared, and then I'm going to add them all up in the way that we did, we saw yesterday. So if I want to compute the area, that's just the integral over the domain, so this is r, of dy dx. Okay, so how do I write that? So we're integrating first with respect to y, so we know that the lower limit is the square root minus a squared minus x squared, and the upper limit is plus the square root of a squared minus x squared. So that's going bottom to top, and then I need to do all the vertical slithers and sum them all up. And so over here we have x is minus a, and over here we have x is plus a. And so to add those slithers up, I need to integrate between minus a and plus a dy dx. So the first step is just going to give me, so we keep the outer integral, integrating with respect to y, well that's straightforward, you evaluating the limits, so we get the value of y on the two limits, which is going to end up giving me 2 times the square root of a squared minus x squared dx. All right, and then to solve that, we might say, well, let's let x be a cos theta. And then in the usual way, dx will be minus a sine theta d theta. And then when x is equal to a, we need to now know what the corresponding value of theta would be. So when x is equal to a, then that would imply theta is equal to zero. And when x is equal to minus a, that would apply theta is equal to pi. So what I'm doing here is thinking about my angle theta. 
which is referred to the x-axis. So x equals zero would be here and x equal pi would be, oh, would be here. <coughs> okay, so substituting all that in, then the area just becomes 2a, the integral from x equals a, which is now theta equals pi, to, sorry, x equals minus a, which is theta equals pi, to x equals a, which is theta equals zero, of, uh, so the square root of a squared minus x squared is, is uh, I've taken the a outside, that's just the square root of one minus cos squared, which is sine theta, times d theta, which is minus a sine theta, d theta, and when I do all that integration, it's 2a, the integral from pi to 0, or minus sine squared theta, d theta. And then if you carry on doing that, uh, you end up with pi a squared. Good, we got it right. So that's fine, we can do that. But actually for this sort of coordinate system, uh, this sort of domain, a much more natural coordinate system to think about is a plane polar coordinate system. And the reason for that is that the boundary is then instead of being this, this uh, x squared plus y squared equals a squared, the boundary just becomes the radius is equal to a. And the value of theta, if we're using plane polar coordinates, just goes between naught and two pi. And integrating uh, over that sort of, uh, integrating over a circular domain using a polar coordinate system has a, is much more straightforward. So, so of course, for this example, it would be much more natural. It would be natural to use polar coordinates. So I'm going to show you how you would do it with polar coordinates and that's setting up how we would do this in general for any coordinate transformation. All right, so suppose we consider a transformation or consider a change of variables from Cartesian. So we're going to go from Cartesian, i.e. x, y, to polar, which I'm going to denote as r, the radial coordinate. So that goes from zero at the origin out to the, radi out to the boundary, which is r equals a, and theta, which is the angle going round, refer to the x-axis. So we're trying to compute the area. So going back to how we think about computing areas as limits, yesterday we thought about dividing our domain up into small increments of area and then summing them all up. So in a Cartesian coordinate system, we thought about little increments of area of width delta x and height delta y. And so our little area element in Cartesian coordinates The area element is delta A equals delta X delta Y. And then you take the limit and what you end up doing is integrating over the domain with respect to X and Y. So what happens in polar coordinates? So what is the area element in polar coordinates? So let's think of our domain again. So here's our circle that we want to integrate over to compute the area. And this time I'm going to use a radial coordinate and a azimuthal coordinate theta. So that theta equals zero corresponds to the x-axis as we had before. So what does it mean to increase by a small amount of theta and what does it mean to increase by a small amount of r? So if I consider r and theta somewhere in the, in the domain, 
So let's suppose we consider the value of theta I've drawn and we consider some value of r here. Then r equal to a constant as theta varies is just a circle. So it goes around like this. All right, so what happens if I increase theta by an amount delta theta? So that means I can draw another ray going out in this direction and denote this angle here as delta theta. Can you see that at the back? Okay. All right, and what happens if I increase the radius by an amount delta r? Well, it means that I add to this radius here a small increment, and so I get myself to another uh, circular uh, shape. But this distance here and here is delta r. I should have drawn it all bigger. Hopefully you can see what I'm trying to do. So we've got two circles. The inner one is of radius r, and the outer one is of radius r plus delta r. And we've got a wedge. Uh, with the uh, angle being delta theta and they're both small so I'm just um, drawn it large just for illustration so here's my little area element this is what happens this is how my area change or my area element um, corresponds to a small change in theta and a small change in r so approximately for small delta r and small delta theta we can approximate the area of this element as this distance here times this distance here. So approximately delta A is going to be given by, well, this distance on the radial direction is just delta R. And then this distance here uh, is just delta theta times by the radius, which is R delta theta. Approximately. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a, 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 I'm a, invoking the fact that delta r and delta theta is small to be allow myself to be able to do this. In an approximate sense, that's what we get. So now, in polar coordinates, I can sum up all those area elements. And so thinking as we did yesterday as a limiting process, I can say that the area is the integral from theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi, because I need to go all the way around and take all values of theta. So I start at theta equals 0 and go all the way around and come back to 2 pi. And the radius goes between naught and a. And the area elements that I'm summing up are r, d theta, dr. And you'll have seen this last term when you did transformations between Cartesians and polar coordinates. This is simply the Jacobian that we're picking up here. Okay, so now I can integrate this and you'll see that it becomes very straightforward because I'm integrating r with respect to theta, first of all. So I, when I integrate with respect to theta, I'm holding r fixed. And so that becomes r theta between the limits naught and two pi dr. And the reason this has become more straightforward is now instead of integrating over a domain where the limits themselves are functions, now I'm just integrating over a rectangular domain in the r theta space. So my limits are just constants. So life has become easy again. So this becomes the integral from naught to a of 2 pi r dr, which is just the integral of pi r squared between naught and a, which thankfully is pi a squared. So what we were doing here really is thinking about instead of having horizontal or vertical slithers and summing them all up, we're thinking about radial slithers and summing all those up. So this can be thought of as, well, what did we do first? We did azimuthal slithers and then sum them all up in the radial direction. So azimuthal slithers no I don't mean that radial slither uh, sorry 
So what I did was divided my domain into radial slithers, so circular slithers going around, and then I summed them all up because I integrated over R. So for each R, I had a, a, ra uh, a circular slither, and then I added them all up. So you could call this circular slithers for fixed R. So that was my theta integration, and then summing area in all the circular slivers. Okay, so of course I could have done it the other way. I could have integrated first with respect to R and then with respect to theta and I would have got the same result. All right, so it's more natural when you've got domains like this to think about using a plane polar coordinate system rather than a Cartesian coordinate system because then the boundaries just become uh, r equals a constant and it makes your integration very straightforward because your limits are themselves constants. But this is an example of uh, an approach where you change your coordinate system from x, y to a different coordinate system and the thing you have to be really careful of is how your area element changes. So if this, if I'd wanted to compute the area using Cartesians I would have just integrated 1 times dx dy. But when I use this coordinate system, I have to remember that I need this radius in here, this r d theta dr. And that's because your area elements are changing size in your transform domain. And so we need a way of doing this uh, more formally. And so what we're going to consider now is thinking about the change of variables and the Jacobian. And this is a way of allowing us to work out how this area element delta A changes under any transformation. Okay, so we saw, saw what the Jacobian was uh, in, the last le in, the, in the introductory calculus. I'll remind you what it is shortly. But the modulus of the Jacobian is a measure of how a mapping or a transformation stretches space locally near a particular point. And the stretching can vary from point to point. So we've actually already seen this example in the Cartesian to polar transformation here. So let's go over to a different, the coordinate systems we were thinking about. So here was my theta, here was my delta theta, here was some r, and here is some r plus delta r. And this is my area element. And over here, when I was doing Cartesians, my area element was delta x, delta y. I just had the small area element is delta x times delta y. So in Cartesians, it's the same everywhere in the plane. We just consider little boxes, all of the same size, and add them up. But under the transformation where we go from x, y to r theta, and we consider small increments in r and small increments in theta, you can see that the area element that we just computed was r delta r delta theta, which means for the same change in theta and the same change in r, these area elements change size and they get bigger as you go further out. And the Jacobian tells you how the mapping does that. So it tells you how you stretch these area elements in Cartesian coordinate systems to area elements in the, in the new coordinate system. All right, so let's suppose we have a general mapping. We're going to go from x, y to 
to u of xy v of xy. So before my u was r and my v was theta, now it's going to be anything we like. We're going to keep it general. Okay, so in X and Y, so in my Cartesian coordinate system, we've got our little area elements and they're going to map. So my little area element as before, that's going to map to a new area element in the UV space. So I'm mapping to uv. In this example, I map to r theta. And my corresponding area element in this coordinate system, delta a equals the modulus of the Jacobian times delta u delta v. So if this is delta u and this is delta v, then the size of that area element uh, it depends on the increments, but also on the modulus of the Jacobian. All right, so I keep talking about this Jacobian. Let's define it. So we're going to consider a, a mapping U is U of X and Y and V equals V of X and Y. And the Jacobian J, just to remind you, we denote as delta X, Y, delta U, V. which is the determinant du, dx, d, oh, no it's not, it's the wrong way around. So it's given by dx, du, dy, du, dx, dv, dy by dv. Okay, so you can compute the determinant for that transformation, take the modulus, and that will tell you how the area elements change. And actually, I'm going to define it the other way. It doesn't matter. Of course, it doesn't matter, but I'm actually going to do this the other way around. I'm going to do dx du, dx dv dy du, dy dv. Okay, so let's give ourselves some um, definitions and make this a bit tighter. So, definition. So, given two coordinates, which we're going to denote u of x and y and v of x and y, which depend only on x and y, we define the Jacobian which I'm going to call J, which is going to be denoted D, U, V, D, X, Y. T, 
to be the determinant Uh, to be the determinant j, it's going to be du, dx, du, dy, dv, dx, dv, dy. So we have to take the partial derivatives of u and v with respect to x and compute the determinant. So we're going to also need it later in three dimensions. So we thought so far about area integrals, but we will we'll be moving on to volume integrals. And so we need the equivalent definition in three dimensions. And in fact, we just define it in the, usual, in the way you would expect. So we define the Jacobian then to be du, v, let's say w for the third coordinate, d, let's say x, y, z, which is going to be the determinant of du dx, du dy, du dz, dv dx, dv dy, dv dz, dw dx, dw dy, dw dz. All right, so let's just check everything's working as we expect. So let's consider an example that we've already thought about a lot today. Let's consider the polar coordinate example. So we're going to go from Cartesians to polars. So in this, under this transformation, we can say that x is just r cos theta and y is r sine theta. So if I consider r going in the usual way out and theta coming referred to the x-axis, then if I consider a point in the plane, I can give you a coordinate r and a coordinate theta, or I can give you its equivalent x and y. And clearly x would just be the distance r cos theta, and y would be the distance r sine theta. So that gives us the transformation between the two coordinate systems. So where r and theta are polar coordinates. Okay, so what's the Jacobian then? So if I want to compute the Jacobian being dx, y, d, r, theta, because I'm writing x and y as a function of r and theta, then this just becomes dx, dr, dx, d, theta, dy, dr, dy, d, theta, and dx dr is cos theta, dy dx d theta is minus r sine theta, dy dr is just sine theta, and this is r cos theta, and then when I take the determinant I get r cos squared theta plus r sine squared theta, so that's just r. Which is as you'd expect because we've already seen that dx dy would transform to r dr d theta under this mapping 
And here the Jacobin is giving you the R that we saw before. Okay. So let's think about how we do this in general. And we're going to uh, state a theorem that we will be using in our examples when we consider these mappings. So the theorem is as follows. And it's a theorem for the change of variables. So let's suppose we have some function f, which takes points in a domain R, so this would be our domain R, to points in a domain S, so in this example this would be our new domain S, and it would be, be a bijection between two regions of R squared. And we want it to have various properties. We want it to be differentiable. Which means we can take partial derivatives as we need. And has a differentiable inverse. Which will denote f to the minus 1. So we can also take partial derivatives of this. So then we're going to want the Jacobians. So the Jacobians, d u v d x y, and the other Jacobian, if you go the other way, d x y d u v, defined and non-zero everywhere. So where u v equals f of x and y. So we have this mapping. It takes points x, y to points u uh, v. So you take any point x, y in the Cartesian plane under this mapping, you return the new point in the u v plane. So over here, you would have taken a point x, y to a point in r theta, so this would be the mapping, so any point over here would just become a new point in the r theta plane. And we want f to be suitably well behaved and invertible, so we can take derivatives and we defined those two Jacobians to exist and be non-zero. Okay, so, so the x, y are coordinates in the first domain, r, so r is a region in the plane, and x, y the coordinates in r, and under s, and under f, this corresponds to a point u, v in S. So we have a region R in the plane. We have a region S and a point x, y under F goes to a point u, v. And equally, you can go backwards and you can say, well, a point UV corresponds to the point in X, Y or in R under the inverse mapping, F to the minus 1. 
So we call f a change in coordinate function. So if we now consider some scalar function, let's call it psi, to be a function of x and y, defined on R, then we can consider an equivalent scalar function defined on S. So this would be defined in terms of x and y because it's defined on R, and R is our uh, region in the xy domain. Then we can think of another function, or think of it as another function we'll call it capital Psi, defined on S in terms of u and v. And we can do this as the function f gives a connection between x, y and u, v. And of course, they're the same thing, they're just expressed in different ways. So we, so we define psi of x, y, which can just be written in terms of big psi of u and v, which is really big psi of u of x and y, v of x and y. So the two things are the same, they're just written in a different way. Okay, so two domains, we've got a mapping, we've got a scalar function we want to integrate, we can define it with respect to the first coordinate system, or equivalently with respect to the second coordinate system. And to keep things straight, I've just given it different notation, so lowercase psi and uppercase psi. Okay, so what is the theorem that we're going to use? Well, then we'll see if I want to integrate over S, so this is in the UV coordinate system, so u, v will take values in s. So I want to integrate my function defined with respect to u and v over that domain, so du, dv. Then that will be equivalent to integrating over the x, y domain. So now x and y take values in r of the scalar function defined with respect to x and y, remember these two things are equivalent, they're just expressed in a different way, times the Jacobian, or the modulus of the Jacobian, so in this case duv dxy dx dy. Okay, so this, we are going from here, you're going from uv to xy, and so the Jacobian is duv dxy. And it's this that is the local scale factor, which was the R that you, would see, you saw uh, in the previous example. But you might want to go the other way. So this is going from UV to XY. You might also want to do, well, I'm going to start in XY and I'm going to integrate the psi of XY dx dy. Well, that's the same as integrating over the region S of the scalar function defined with respect to the UV coordinates. And now I need the Jacobian, which in this case is dxy duv du dv. So when we did our first example about half an hour ago, where we went from Cartesian to plane polars, we started over here, but psi was really straightforward. It was just one. So this was still one. And the factor r, so this would have been dr, this would have been d theta, 
the factor R that we got, the scale factor, was precisely the modulus of the Jacobian that we're seeing here. So this is the theorem we're going to use, and if you look in your online lecture notes, uh, you'll see a sketch of the proof, if you're interested. Um, but what I want to do now is just give an example of this in action. So, suppose we want to show, suppose I want to show that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx is equal to the square root of pi. So can we show that? So the first thing to notice is now we've been thinking about up to now domains which are finite, so we've had finite limits. And here we have a domain that's infinite, we have infinite limits. So we'll define that at the start, so we're clear what we're doing. So to evaluate the integrals, we're going to define uh, integrals over an infinite domain. So here we're going from x equals minus infinity to x equals plus infinity. So if we're thinking of things of this form, so we define the integral from minus infinity to infinity of some function of x dx to be the limit as big X tends to infinity, big Y tends to infinity of the integral Y uh, minus infinity f of x dx. So we're going to uh, just think of this in a limiting sense where we have limits x and y, x and y, and we just take those to tend to infinity. So to make progress here, we're going to start by evaluating the integral i over the um, the plane r squared of e to the minus x squared plus y squared dA. All right, so we're going to integrate, at the minute it's all on a Cartesian coordinate system, we're going to integrate this function over the entire plane, so this is an infinite domain, with respect to dA, which I'm going to write as dx dy, and from this we're going to hence determine the integral that we want, e to the minus e, e to the minus t squared dt between minus infinity and infinity. So because we've got this x squared plus y squared, as soon as you see x squared plus y squared, you should immediately be thinking, ah, that's r squared if I'm thinking of polar coordinates. And in fact, it's more natural to consider polar coordinates. And so we define, here's our mapping, x equals r cos theta and y equals r sine theta. So we're taking x, y to u, v, and in this example, u and v, those coordinates are r and theta. So then I, that we're uh, wanting to integrate this integral over r squared, is e to the minus x squared plus y squared dA. But now, because I'm using polar coordinates, that becomes the integral over r squared of e to the minus r squared, because x squared plus y squared is simply r squared. And then instead of using here dx dy, I have to ensure that I do the scale factor because I'm changing coordinate systems. And so spelling it out, this becomes dr theta dx y. No, it doesn't. dxy dr theta dr d theta and we've seen already today that this is just r. So now you've got the problem to integrate over r squared of r e to the minus r squared dr d theta which is great because you've got the derivative of the exponential exponent in pre-multiplying the function so now we can integrate that easily 
And we also note that this doesn't depend on theta. So we can do the two integrations separately. So we get the integral over the radius. So that's the whole domain. So that goes between naught and infinity of r e to the minus r squared dr times the integral from naught to 2 pi d theta. OK, to cover the whole plane, the radius has to go from naught to infinity and you have to get all theta values. So this becomes 2 pi from here. This is a very straightforward integration, 2 pi. This becomes the integral from r. This becomes e to the minus r squared times minus a half between naught and infinity. And then the upper limit gives you nothing because you get e to the minus infinity squared, so that's going to tend to zero. And you end up with pi. Um, yeah, you just end up as pi as your answer. All right, so we've been able to do this integration, but this isn't the question. What we want to know is what is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus t squared dt? So let's go back to that. Let's let j, which is the thing we're trying to find, which is e to the minus t squared dt. And then let's consider j squared. So j squared, I can write as e to the minus infinity to infinity e to the minus x squared dx where x is now taking the role of a dummy variable, minus infinity to infinity e to the minus y squared dy, y being the dummy variable here, which I can just write as the integral over the entire plane of e to the minus x squared plus y squared dx dy. And we've just computed that. This is just the i that we got, which was pi. So j squared is equal to pi, Ooh. and we know that we want j to be positive because the integrand is positive and we're integrating something positive over the entire domain, so it has to be positive, and so we have that j is equal to root pi as required. Which brings us very nicely to the end of the example on this particular example, there are more in the, in the notes and on the first example sheet there are examples of thinking about how you compute these things by doing coordinate transformations. And then next week we're going to move on away from area integrals and take these ideas and consider how we uh, compute volume integrals using many of the same approaches that we've done today and yesterday. So see you Monday. <laughs>